Hey, what's up, everybody? Jeff Aiken here. Brent's not with me at the moment. We are getting ready to dive into the movies. We're starting within the beginning, and then we're going to kind of go in an order that our good buddy John uh, gave to us. We're going to hit those over the next few weeks. The reality is, though, Brent was recently here in Portland with me. It's where we recorded Sleeping in Light. We also watched In the Beginning together. If you want to catch our full unedited reaction to that. It's over on our Patreon, patreon.com slash Babylon 5 first or patreon.com slash Nerds. So you can check that out. We'll have the full, uh, we'll have the YouTube uh, reaction up next week as well as the full discussion on the movie. But in the meantime, to get ready, to get our minds in the space for in the beginning, we're going to go back. We're going to go back a really long ways. We're going to watch our discussion of And the Sky Full of Stars. I'm so excited to bring this to all of you right here, right now. It's been two years, two years, almost two, it's been more than two years, two and a half years since we watched that episode. And we know, we know the story now. And after watching in the beginning, we've seen so much that surrounds it. So I can't wait to go back and see what we thought of it at that time when we first watched it. So, and the sky full of stars is going to start right here in a minute. Next week, we'll be back with In the Beginning, the reaction here on YouTube, full reaction on Patreon, and our discussion as scheduled next week. It's my first time. Time. Welcome to Babylon 5 for the first time. Not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I am watching Babylon 5 for the first time. And I'm Brent Allen, and I'm also watching Babylon 5 for the first time. We're two veteran Star Trek podcasters that are watching Babylon 5 for the first time. We're searching for Star Trek like messages in this series. And by that, we don't mean like. Is this a Star Trek episode? But does this give us a roadmap? Does this give us hope for a better future? Or frankly, does it teach us how to be better human beings? That's right. That's right. And Jeff, did, did you know that this is not a podcast about Star Trek? It's not? Or rather, I should say it's a podcast about not Star Trek. Yeah, that makes perfect yeah, sense to me. So, yeah. But that being said, uh, just kind of given the nature of who we are, we are sure to pull in some of those references. And so Jeff and I have sort of come up with a little game that we like to play uh, where I don't know what we call it. The rule of three or something like that, where uh, we only get three Trek references each per episode. Now, last week, Jeff, I don't think we came close to using our three. Um, so we'll no, see what happens you think. this week. Like, go back and listen. We actually hit quite a few last oh, week. Oh, did we really? Yeah, okay, we did. there you go. You keep better track of that than I do during the show. But anyway, with that, Jeff, choose your spots carefully because I'm not giving you any of mine this week. See about that. Well, Brent, you talked about the incredible interactions that we get, or you've talked about the incredible interactions that we get from people all across, all across the internet, right? YouTube, from our website, Babylon five first.com, the number five, the word first, or on Twitter at Babylon first. If it's cool, I want to share a couple that we've gotten in the last little while. What if it's not cool? Would you just do it anyway? No, I'd say, okay, well, I guess you don't really want to hear from our incredible listeners, but you know, okay, that'd well, be a cool. you thing, not a me thing. So right. well, it's cool. Then let's do it. That's what I thought. Let's start on Twitter again. That's at Babylon first. And this is from Keith Gardner at J K G Oak. 42. What's up, Keith? Keith says, you guys are doing a great job. I watched B5 when it first came out and was blown away. No spoilers, but you will remember this episode. I listened to you on Stitcher, and this is my first episode with you. Love the fresh eyes on this. We'll have to go back and catch up. Do you know what episode he's referring Like, when did the, I know we're not always, these aren't always in time. What episodes he talking about? Do you know? I think this is, I think he's talking about Born to the Purple. Okay. Yes, we will remember that episode. I remember liking that episode. Well, and we've already remembered it. Like we've oh, already had a big thing up. in last week's episode. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Wando and Jakar, man. I, I'm liking these two guys, although, you know, Riot Insider Jakar, I don't know about anymore. 
And then one of my favorites from an episode a while ago, I went back to grab mm-hmm. um, some off of YouTube. Cause it's, <laughs> I tell you what, on YouTube, it is it is a challenge to keep up with all the comments on there. Mm-hmm. And that's I, a good challenge, but you're it's right. It's a great it one. I, yeah. and, and the thing is, there's really great conversations happening there. And so oh, yeah. like, I'm drawn yeah. to that all the time. It's so cool. This one's from, and I'm going to pronounce it wrong. I, pr- I, I apologize. Galen Dugall on YouTube. It's very short, but this is so good. If you don't like Londo's password, just wait until you hear what Garibaldi's is. No. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to know. We're going to play the game right now, Jeff. You get one guess. I get one guess. What's Garibaldi's password? Oh, my gosh. This is a family-friendly podcast. It is. That makes this really hard. I think that's my guess for what his password is. Hard? No, just the whole phrase. Just the whole phrase I said. I'll just leave it there. You can 15 seconds back and listen to it again. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um. I mean, it's either his second favorite thing in the universe, which is Duck Dodgers, or it's 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 full on um, President Scrooge from from Spaceballs. One, two, three, four, five. What kind of password an idiot would have on their luggage. <laughs> it's amazing. That's the same password I have on my luggage. <laughs> God, that movie's great. <laughs> from that same uh, episode on YouTube, yes. Simon Giles hits us with some huge spoiler free knowledge. Oh, thank you for spoiler free. Brent, I, I read this. I lost my mind. So this is back. Um, again, this is all born to the purple. I'm pulling these from. He says, mm-hmm. oh, by the way, it's the same guy who gets thrown across the room by both Kodoth and Trachis. And that actor is Chuck Norris's son. No way. What? Yeah. I missed this comment. What? Isn't that incredible? And they get thrown, it, the guy gets thrown across, like, is it the same character getting thrown across? And this is like a running joke? Well, I don't, same actor in there. Maybe it is a kind of a thing. Maybe he's going to be the guy who's like, oh, you throw me. He just, like, like it's what is it? In South Park, Kenny gets killed every single week. Like, this guy gets thrown across every week. <laughs> but let's be clear. This is Chuck Norris's son, so really the room is getting thrown across him. That is fair. That is fair. Love. Love hearing from all of you. It's Fantastic. Again, Babylon five first.com, the number five, the word first at Babylon first on Twitter, or you can find us on YouTube really anywhere. You throw us a comment. Cannot wait to interact with you and share some of that great stuff right here on the show. And speaking of the show, we're discussing episode eight. Is this eight? It's hard to keep track, I guess, but this is, and the sky full of stars. Now, last week, Brent, if you remember, we guessed what this episode was going to be about <laughs> based on the title alone. Do you yeah. remember? Do you remember what you guessed? I think, it, Oh man, this was like a week ago. I think <laughs> it was something of the nature of like, like some massive space armada is going to come out and the sky's full of stars. And it had something to do with Indiana Jones's father yeah, and there was Charlemagne that. and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. I was way off base. This is another one of those titles that I'm like, I don't see how it applies at all. Stand by, we'll be right back. Are you ready to take your Babylon 5 for the first time experience to the next level? With our exclusive Patreon, you'll get access to all kinds of cool stuff that you can only find there. Our recording notes, unedited reaction videos, an exclusive Discord community. And you can even be listed as a producer of the show. Plus, we even offer exclusive meet and greets and hangouts. You won't find this kind of experience anywhere else. Get all these amazing benefits, plus the opportunity to interact with other fans from around the world. It's being part of a huge community where everyone shares the same appreciation for Babylon 5. Subscribe at patreon.com slash Babylon 5 first. That's the number five in the word first to get access to these incredible benefits. That's patreon.com slash Babylon 5 first. We can't wait to see you there. I I was even, I mean, you had an armada and there's definitely like ships in this one. So it's a whole lot closer than me where I thought some alien was going to come on board and be like, Oh, look at all this great stuff. The stars on Babylon 5 or the flip side of like, oh, you should come see what we have on my planet. Yeah, mm-hmm. Not even. No, not even not in the all. ballpark. But to find out what it is about. Right. For those of you that haven't 
watch this in like 30 years. Those of you watching along with us or those of you who aren't watching and just listening to our wonderful, beautiful, soothing voices, Brent Allen is going to tell us what this was actually about. Brent, tell us about the episode. Well, it's another week on Babylon 5, which means we're getting some more shady people coming to the station. This time, it's a pair of guys who have arrived separately, but they're winking and nodding at each other. So that definitely means they're up to something. And that something is kidnapping Sinclair and using some kind of a weird mind probe to find out answers to this question. Why did the Minbari pull back during the war at the Battle of the Line? It's some Matrix-like stuff going on inside Sinclair's brain. And while he's reliving those last moments of the war, he's fighting it, something fierce. We learn that Sinclair was in charge of a large platoon of fighters, and they were in a tough spot getting killed left and right, and Sinclair finally decides to go full-on kamikaze on them. But just before he rams into the Mimbari ship, he gets flashy-thinged, and the Mimbari pull him into their ship and proceed to torture him, it seems like, for a few days. And we also learned that aboard ship during that time was the Gray Council. You know, that whole thing Delin was supposed to be a part of. At least that's who we're to assume it is. And that means Delin was also there. And she had the weird triangle thing on her head that all the rest of them do and was a big symbol throughout the course of this episode. It's right about then that Sinclair breaks out of the mind probe. And after a brief pew, pew, pew fight where Sinclair thinks he's back in the war, he finally comes to his senses. And while he tells Delin otherwise, Sinclair remembers everything this time where there used to be a hole in his memory. But back with Delin, one of the gray council turns out is lurking in the back of her quarters because sure, why not? And he's there telling Delin that if Sinclair remembers so much as an iota, then he must die. So Sinclair's got a big secret he needs to keep, but he's got to find out why and what happened. He has to, Jeff. He has to. He must. 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 I'm going to tell you, Brent, um, I watched this episode twice, to, as, mm-hmm. as is my custom, to get ready mm-hmm. for this, this, this podcast. And my reaction that I had initially is different than the reaction I had after I watched it the second time. But, but what's interesting on reflection, so here's kind of where, where I landed after watching it the second time. I love that we know more about what Mm -hmm. happened at the battle of the line that we got to see it, that we met his, one of his, well, we met the memory of one of his, uh, his his shipmates, soldiers that he he flew with. Tom Riddle from the diary. (laughs) Mitchell. Yeah. That's who we met. Yeah. I mean, it's exactly. Yep. yep. But really we didn't learn anything new in this. Mm -hmm. This confirmed everything that we know. And now Sinclair knows everything that we know. He did a log entry to that's the, 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 the cap of this episode. The end was him doing a log entry. that was about, I don't know, 45 seconds long. I think mm-hmm. you could have listened to that. It gave you everything that happened in this episode, but then we wouldn't have had an episode. Exactly. We had to, we had to step through the whole thing, right. And do, uh, right. do all this stuff. Right. Now, what the show did for me though, is I kind of learned a thing about me watching this mm. and that thing I learned Brent, I kind of love this show. Mm. I felt I felt a real connection to Sinclair. I felt the anxiety and the tension when he was like falling through the corridors, when he was thinking he was back in the war. Mm-hmm. There's that security guard that came out that he took a shot at. And I yeah. felt that. I was just like, oh, my gosh. And then you saw like the way they cut with Delenn coming down a hallway while he was. I'm like, oh, my gosh, he's going to shoot Delenn. Like, this is going to go. I was so pulled into that the first time I watched this episode that my takeaway was, I, I love this show. It's great. I do think that 100% of the inspiration for one of my favorite episodes of Deep Space Nine, which is Inquisition, <laughs> almost all the inspiration for that was from this episode, right? So you had, I think his name was Knight Number Two. That was basically Director Sloan. And then they... Sinclair goes to bed. He wakes up in some weird place, just like Bashir did in that episode. And then Sloan messes with him and like gets in his face and tries to get him to admit things or whatever. Just like this knight gets in Sinclair's head and tries to get him like, and then the overacting, (laughs) the dramatic overacting by knight number two, who is not, by the way, the super cool guy that actually sat 
at the helm for Khan in Star Trek II. How cool was that? We got Joachim or whatever his name was in there. Joachim. 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 Yeah. That's so cool that he was. That's that was great that he was in here. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of fun stuff. There's cool stuff to dig into. I'm sure there's more that we'll talk about as we dive in. But Brent, what was your first reaction to this? Yeah, um, I'm with you. I liked this episode. I did not like this episode as much as I liked last week's episode. Last week's was perfect. So good. But this was this was a solid move the story down the line. Yes, they could have told us everything in a piece of exposition as a log entry at the end. But that's not how you tell stories on television you have to show it to them and they showed it to us and then told us and then told us this episode confirmed a lot of what we have heard before and actually showed us what we'd heard before kind of showed us how it went down i think we got some new things like i don't think we knew that sinclair got pulled into the mimbari ship and tortured for a few days or that he tried to ram it or that he tried to ram it Mm. right Um, we didn't, we didn't know that Delenn is a satire and part of the great council that they had, uh, shrouds over their face and weird looking circles with lights and spotlights and all that kind of stuff. This, this episode got me quite a bit. Like, like when Sinclair first gets pulled into the mind probe and he's walking around deep space nine and it's empty deep space nine. I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm not going to buzz you on that one. That was a, that was an honest Babylon five. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but like he's he's walking around and and everything's empty and I was like did he just get transported to like a different Babylon 5 and I said oh no maybe he's on like a hollow deck inquisition I'm telling you like it's the same thing yeah and then I went oh no they're in his brain and when you get to that scene where like the lights are shutting off down the corridor and he's just standing in the one light pool and then the guy pops up in the corner I'm like this is fantastic. Like, this is so good. It was so, it was just perfect. I loved it. I loved it a lot. Um, but we're also left with a lot more questions, Yeah, you know? Um, and that's, that's what I, that's what I like. We really didn't get a lot of answers, more confirmation. And then we got more questions, but you mentioned, and I'll close my opening pieces with this. You, you mentioned being more connected to Sinclair. And I think that is spot on for this episode. I have said in previous episodes that for a guy who is supposed to be number one on the call sheet for the guy who is supposed to be leading the show, I am not connected to my captain, my commander at all. Like I could care less about this guy right now. I have no attachment to him. This one gave me an attachment to him. It brought me around to what the heck is going on with Sinclair. It really uh, the the whole piece, and we've we've said this. I feel like over the last couple of episodes that he's had he's got some PTSD from mm-hmm. the war, and that's why he's going out doing all these things that he really ought not be. And Garibaldi's been calling him on it, like you don't need to be going out there doing that kind of stuff, dude. To see that this is what it's left over, like when when he is a commander sitting there, and all of his people get shot down, and then he just goes, "Okay, I'm ramming this sucker in." And he's, he's full board. Like, this is how he's going to die. Mm -hmm. He has accepted it. This is what he's doing. He's going down with the fight. He's going down with his people, with his crew, and they're all gone. And just before he gets that moment of glory, he gets whisked away. That can, that can mess you up, man. Like he was ready to go. And now all of a sudden he's alive when he should be dead. And that brings him to what's going on now. And he, you know, you imagine after the war, he's this great savior and hero, the lone survivor of that battle. And, you know, that's how he winds up with this military uh, promotion to the to the commander of the station. And he's the representative of Earth and because he's not going to back down. He's a tough fighter, you know, like all that stuff. And the whole time he's just sitting there like, I should be dead. I should be dead. Well, and I think in other shows, the Mitchell, right? The Mitchell character there would have, he would have been there because he did something nefarious, right? Like, mm. and the knight kept trying to bring that up and make that play. Like, what did you do? What? No, I, mm-hmm. I think that Mitchell just represents what he wishes happened to him. Mitchell went out fighting and that's what he, that's how, like you said, Sinclair accepted it. And he now even 10 years later wishes that's how he died. But here he is having to keep going. I really liked how they talked about after after the war, when he woke up, found out they had surrendered and he walked around forever. 
trying to had to talk himself out of strangling every Minbari that he saw. Yeah. Like pure hatred. And I get that. Mm -hmm. I'm a vet. I never was in war, but I have a lot of friends who have been in war Mm -hmm. and you don't just, Oh, they signed, they signed the treaty. Okay, cool. Everything's fine. Now let's go and sing a song or whatever. No, that's Mm -hmm. stuff sits with you for a long time, if not forever. Yeah. And first of all, thank you for your service and to all who have served. Uh, Thank you. Um, I can imagine. I can imagine. I, I mean, I feel that on a really stupid level involving sports. I have sports teams that I absolutely abhor. I hate. I hate everything about them. I don't like the people who play for them. I don't like people who've played for them in the past. I don't like anything about these organizations. And that carries through <laughs> like like irrationally. Like, like I like I get that irrational. I see somebody in another jersey and I just want to go punch them. Now I don't because I'm a grown human being with you know, command functions and centers and things that go, Hey, you probably ought not do that, but I ain't gonna lie. It's kind of like the thoughts there. Yeah. Yeah. The thoughts there for sure. For sure. Uh, not at all. I'm sure what you're just describing or what Sinclair, like on a very minuscule level, it it is that real quick, before we go much further, you mentioned the Knights Mm -hmm. and night number one was Joaquin from wrath of Khan. Yeah. Right. You know, we actually saw him two other times in Star Trek. I'm so glad, too, because he got credited for those other ones. Yeah, he didn't get credited for the Wrath of Khan, which is the one where you recognize him. Yeah. From, right. But the other one, he was in the Andy Dick episode of Voyager. Right. Yeah. Where he was one of the Romulans. So you didn't you didn't quite see him. But he was also in uh, another season one episode of TNG, which was not a great episode. But it's the one where like like one group was exploiting another group, kind of basically keeping them hooked on drugs. It was a drug episode. It was the one, right? When Tasha Yar's like, drugs feel good, Wesley. Right. Also, we just right. got to hit it. I got I got to hit it. But I'm going to wrap this next one into that one. Okay. Because night number two, because I just had to look him up, a guy named Christopher Neem, we actually saw him twice in Trek as well. Really? He was in the Beowulf episode of Voyager. And then he was in, uh, he was in as a Nazi in Enterprise during the season four episodes uh, during that fail when they were going to make that the whole season arc. And then Manny Cotto thankfully pulled them out of that. Um, anyway, so those are those two guys, but definitely one dude pops on and I'm like, I know this guy, Joaquin, right? Yeah. I'm going to call him Joaquin, night number one. Yeah. It's like, I know this guy. They come in and you know, when they give each other that nod across the room at the very beginning of the show, I went, something's about to explode. Something is going to blow up. And then, okay, maybe not blow up, but they're here to get Sinclair because they, you know, we're here to, you know, yeah, figure this him. out. Right, well, and frankly, right. Joaquin never plays a good guy. Like he's never, he's never the good right. guy. So it's pretty clear. And, and clearly neither, neither, neither is the other guy either. Mm-hmm. And you're right. You said it in the recap. Like every episode starts with like, Hey, the big bad is coming onto the station and we know they're the big bad because you can hear it in the music. Right. They're the guy <laughs> who's coming onto the station. Uh, I got it. So speaking of music, the music faked me out. Uh, the whole secondary plot, which mattered, like it could have not been in this episode at all. wouldn't have made a difference. Um, although, according to our friends, that's probably setting something up for another episode. Something down the road. huge. Yeah. Um, although he died. So who knows what? But anyway, Benson, the, the, the little security guy, he's getting roughed up, right? Uh, by, by these guys. And when those two guys walk off camera, there is this weird like sound effect that could have just been part of the, the score. But I, it really made me think that they had disappeared via that cloak that we saw last week. Oh, like it was like a foom, foom, like as they both walked out and I went, huh. now I don't think that's what it was. I think they were just walking away, but like I had to rewind it because I like it, it caused, it gave me pause to, go, oh, is that what these guys are? Like, <laughs> that'd be huge. Really It'd be pretty big deal. If you're right, if you're right, like you win, you will win the Babylon five for the first time prize. I don't know what that is, but you would have nailed it. <laughs> okay, let's talk about this. Dr. Franklin's a hitchhiker hopping hopping around on a bunch of different starships. I'll doctor for you. Is that cool? Right. The only question I have is, did he have a guide to the galaxy? I'm looking for my bump bump. But there it is. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be here all week, folks. <laughs> uh, but no, the really important thing, and this actually goes back to the bigger story at hand. He turns around and asks Delenn, so what did you do during the war? And she 100% sidestepped that question. Yeah, she no-sells totally. Right. 
And that's going to be, she's definitely hiding some stuff. And so what do, what do you think, Jeff? Okay. Let's, let's speculate. Is Delenn bad? What's going on? Like what, like we have to speculate at this point. I think the gray council is bad. And I think that Delenn is a part of the gray council. But I think that her experiences are changing where she's coming from. So she is face to face with Sinclair and he's got the gun pointed right at her face and Mm -hmm. talking about music and how the soundtrack really worked here. The soundtrack, the blocking of the scene, everything said he was going to shoot her like this wasn't going to be the fake out. And I'm just like, it's going to happen. And then he faked out really well done scene. But what she kept saying was, I'm your friend. I'm your friend. And I thought one of two things, either she's seen the world in a different way and she's going to start breaking from the gray council in, in little ways. We'll see little things or second, that was part of the conditioning that they ran Sinclair through. I'm your friend. Yeah, that was my thing. Cause I was like, cause when she, when he snapped out of it or maybe this was what snapped him out of it, she said, welcome home. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure which one happened first. I don't know if he snapped out of it and then she said, welcome home, or if she said, welcome home, and then he snapped out of it. I really don't know. But when she did that, like, I went, like, that. my head immediately went to Winter Soldier. Totally. Yeah. Like, sh- they've got this dude, and she's there to supervise. And when other Grey Council dude popped out of the back, because you always have somebody hanging out in the back Yeah, room, what was that? And, and like, like, yeah, with the triangle and the gray yeah, eyes. Like, he's not mm. even blending in right now. So, like what's your deal? And, you know, we know that there's that the question has been asked and put before us. What is the Satai doing playing ambassador? Why is she here? She told her assistant, keep this quiet. Do not call me that. She is clearly not in hiding, but she's clearly hiding who she is Mm -hmm. from everybody else. This has to start to start. I know we're only eight episodes into what, what's a 26 episode season or something like that. So we got lots to go, but they're hyping this this question quite a bit. Well, and, and it is starting. Sinclair knows yeah. at this point. Yeah. Like he at least knows that. And he knew enough. Cause he, I mean, he was going to shoot her straight in the face and then she yeah. somehow pulled him out of that. And immediately he knew that he knew and that he couldn't let her know. Right. Like he immediately was like, that he had to play stupid. Yeah. 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 I, I, I want to believe, right. That Delenn is, is experiencing things and growing much like I can assume Sinclair did where he went from wanting to strangle Minbari every time he saw them to now working in, in mm-hmm. really great harmony with them. I want to believe that's the path that she's on, but I don't have anything to prove one way or the other at this point. So let's talk about the, the, the triangle. Cause we saw that quite a bit in this episode, the triangle mark on the head, mm-hmm. which Delenn had in the vision. She doesn't have it now. The other guy clearly has it. We also saw the triangle in the staff, like the magic staff that they used. There was also the triangle um, in, in the, the, the bonds. He was hanging from a triangle there. And then they actually did like, they actually had a a men in black flashy thing. That was also a triangle that that did like the little amulet of Van Helsing from uh, the monster squad. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, but (laughs) But this this symbol, I mean, this isn't the Deathly Hallows we're talking about, no. here, but the symbol is something. Well, and I think you and I were talking before we started recording about how symbols actually have a meaning in this show. Last mm-hmm. week when Home Guard branded Mayan, that symbol was like a combination of, it's, it's what we now know as the non-binary symbol, right? It's a combination of male and female. That's what we use it for today. Not that. Back then, I mean, it would be humanity. Just Mm -hmm. because of male, female. Yeah. 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 And so they use that triangle so much and so explicitly like Mm -hmm. they, they didn't need to have him hanging at all. They made the choice to have him hanging and then had on a triangle. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that means, but clearly something because gray council dude who lives in her closet had it. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. He, he very much had the, uh, the 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 prior of the ori which you don't know what that is jeff because you don't watch stargate we'll do that after we're done with babylon 5 here <laughs> and you'll find out all about that you'll find out about your daughter's namesake actress and what all happened there anyway yeah so here's then the question and i feel like one of the knights asked this question i didn't make the note but talking about government stuff and they were asking the question is there collusion between 
Is there something happening between the Mimbari and Earth government or Earth military or something? Because that's what the, that's ultimately what they wanted to know from Sinclair was was he in cahoots with the Mimbari and that's why he got out of there, right? What do we make of this? Because this feels significant. What if? What if there is some sort of collusion and this started out as a plan, right? And mm-hmm. they they were, we're going to put a fifth column in place and you're going to know about him and you're going to make choices. Like you're going to choose to put this guy in charge of Babylon five, where these things are happen, happening and going mm-hmm. on. Everything they said was true. Here's where it gets wild in my head. Earth wants out of that deal. They don't want to continue anymore. Maybe they're not getting what they wanted or whatever. What better way to sever that than to start race wars out? And so the home guard and these hate groups and the earth president, Luis Santiago, really uniting everyone. Which, by the way, by the way, just to remind, remind us that he was reelected. Yes. Mm-hmm. Which means he had been the president for at least a number of years. I don't know how many, I don't know how long a term is for earth presidents in the future, but he had been, he had overseen this over the last few years as well. So he made the decision he wants out and then he got reelected and he's like, all right, let's start mobilizing these, these, these hate groups that we've been putting together and whatever. So that then we can get out of this deal with the Minbari. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's kind of what you started stepping through that. And I'm like, I think there might be a connection in there. And maybe these two nights are completely right. What's here. Here's what would be even more interesting is, is that if the Minbari are actually in cahoots with the earth first government itself, that wants out the Minbari want out. No, the like, Oh, like, like this, this earth first government, like the Santiago and all that, they're actually the ones in cahoots with the Minbari creating these earth wars and are creating this, this thing. And I don't know why they would do that, but you know, I don't know. There's like we said, more questions. We, we got more questions than we received answers. Well, I feel like at this point, It'd be really easy to have the cork board with the pictures and the red yarn connecting everything. We know exactly enough to become Babylon five conspiracy theorists. And that's it. That's all we can be. That's exactly, that's exactly what we should be right now. That's, that's exactly where we should be trying to, so that all the people out there listening to us and all the people out there watching us on YouTube or wherever they're, they're catching the show are just going to laugh at us and see how absolutely. No. And like, because the truth is Jeff, it's probably in front of our faces the whole time. The whole time we'll be like, Oh my gosh, how could I not have oh, seen of that? Of course thing? it was Londo the whole time. Okay. So I'm going to, I want to pivot onto just one little thing I observed that kind of, kind of pulls Jakar and Londo in a little bit. So there's a scene, I think it's Garibaldi is reading the newspaper and mm-hmm. you get a pretty good look at what's going on in that newspaper. So I paused it. Oh, I didn't even look at that. Yeah. What is it? So, and, and, I'm, and I was thinking of you when I paused it, because this is like, this is that incredible attention to detail world building uh-huh. stuff. So one, I saw that the newspaper is called Universe Today, like USA Today, which I thought was pretty great. So a couple of the headlines in there, the one that brought Jakar and Londo in literally says, Narns settle Ragesh controversy. That was the headline. So that was the whole midnight on the firing line thing. I don't know how they resolved it, but it's settled. There's not a controversy there anymore. There's one that said that San Diego is still too radioactive for occupancy. Now, I feel like I feel like something was mentioned about San Diego at some point, but I haven't gone back and listened to our stuff or watched in there. But I don't know if it was a war or a terrorist thing. Yeah, I don't remember that. Oh, it might have been like some sort of a terrorist thing. Yeah, like it might have been. Yeah, I remember. But the one that wraps into this conversation about the conspiracy theory uh-huh. was there was a big headline saying that Psycor was in hot water for endorsing a VP candidate, something about okay. like violet. So a lot of things jumped out to me here. One, we've seen in just a, like two episodes, the power of Psycor and what telepaths can do. We really just saw that, right? Like was that last week or the week before we saw, you know, what they can really do. Why are they publicly endorsing politicians when they can just use their brains and influence the stuff. So they're throwing a red herring over here. And they mentioned the VP. I didn't take the, a, a, a note of the name on there. I don't mm-hmm. know if they are the vice president or not, but like they're publicly attaching themselves to a political figure. Mm-hmm. While I think we both thought after mind war that they're influencing public sentiment around things using their telepathic powers. Mm-hmm. Armin Bari telepath. 
telepaths at all? You know, I've had that thought. I feel like they should I've be. really had that thought. Yeah. Yeah. And so is this a, a bigger issue, right? So we're seeing the racial stuff going on. Mm-hmm. We're seeing that surface level government stuff of is Earth colluding with the Minbari? But is there something deeper where the Minbari telepaths and Psychor are coming together for some sort of universal domination of these super mind people? Or, or that's actually who's at war. Oh man, yeah. Psychor and the, it's actually it's not Earth versus Mimbari. It's Psychor versus Mimbari. And so, okay, let's let's wrap around to this. Um, we have to ask this question and go back to the I think this the central piece of it is why did the Mimbari pull back at the last moment? I think it's clear now that when the Mimbari captured Sinclair, they they read his mind, they tortured him, they got him to confess to something, whatever it was that they did that they wound up wiping his memory. I know that in sci-fi world, you can do that with a device. You also can do it this telepath. Mm-hmm. And they have whatever this thingy is, the flashy thing. It's something that they got out of Sinclair that caused them as a whole to pull back, right? And to buy their time. So I have a new theory. Okay. I want to spin a theory for you. The Membari were at war with Earth for whatever reason. I don't know why. But not because maybe they wanted to, but because they felt like they had to exterminate humanity to keep the galaxy safe. And when they probed Sinclair's mind, he showed them that humanity actually could be worth saving and they didn't need to be exterminated because Sinclair is the ultimate good guy. Remember, he's our hero of the story. Mm -hmm. He's not like Psychor. He's not like those guys. They something happened where they said these guys aren't all bad. And we can't like, like almost like the Mimbari are the ultimate, like, like good guys. Like we're going to wipe you out if you're just completely evil. But if there's some hope of good in you, we're going to help you. And so they pull back. And now Delenn as a Satai is sent to Babylon five to help humanity become what it has the potential to be. That's why she's there, but she can't, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, imagine in all our old uh, old things, when a god comes to Earth, he can't tell people he's a god. He has to hide out as a human, mm-hmm. right? Like, you see that in, in ancient Greek mythology. You see that in Christianity. You see that in everything. And you see it in all our sci-fi stuff. All all of Stargate's kind of the same thing. Well, they don't pretend, but anyway, whatever. That's what Delenn is doing is she is almost disguising herself to help them become, what, like, that's what they're doing. Like, they're kind of not taking the lead role. But they're behind the scenes with the Lynn helping this to help humanity become as a last best hope for peace. That, that, that humanity is the last best hope. So now we're getting into a Star Trek idea. This is a theory. I'm not saying that's what yeah. this is. But as a theory. It tracks. It totally tracks. And here's why I think it tracks. We know the Narn don't have telepaths. We know that Jakar right. was disgusting with Lita Alexander about that. Mm-hmm. And somehow they're going to have to die. Yeah. Right. Jakar and Londo have to die by the end of this show. Well, it's right? in 20 years, like, because Londo has years, seen yeah. it. So we, we, right. we already know how that's going to happen. I'm going to assume Centauri aren't telepaths because the entire basis of their political power is having dirt on each other and hiding it and sharing it and whatever. And if they're telepaths, well, that's out the window. So right. Minbari, we're calling it here. They're telepaths. According to, to, mm-hmm. to Jeff and Brent, that's what they are. They, we meet, they meet humanity and they've got telepaths and they're like, no. We went through centuries, right, to to learn the discipline and the rules and the whatever to 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 keep this safe. You're just the wild west of telepaths. You're gone. You're you're going to destroy everything. Yeah. We saw in uh, with with Ironheart. We saw the what the potential the potential for humanity is. So they're going to put a stop to that. I love though that Sinclair. That makes so much sense. He's the paragon of humanity. Yes, right. we can make something out of this. But they're going to need guidance. They're going to need help. Mm-hmm. And that's Delenn's job. I'm in. Yeah. And that's why she's there. That's what she's doing. And that's why she can't tell them what she knows. You know? So anyway, like I say, just my theory. Here's, here's my one hole. My one hole. Okay. I, oh, there's a lot of holes because I have, I have the <laughs> biggest hole at the end of this. Okay, yeah. Well, the big thing there is if, if, if him knowing what happened means they have to kill him, like, wouldn't it just be kill them all? Like, don't just kill Sinclair. Oh. If he finds out about it, we're going to kill them all mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm sure you've got bigger holes. In I, well, I mean, that's it. My whole theory is ruined by triangle head dude at the end screaming. 
if he finds out, we've got to kill him. Like, really? You, if he finds out the truth, you have to kill him. Like, that doesn't make sense no. at all either. So, I had one more thought. I had one more thought that I wanted to hit before we dive into anything sure. else. Sure. Because we can't, we can't have an episode of Babylon 5 without Jeff talking about how Sinclair oversteps his bounds as a leader and doesn't do sure. a great job. So, Benson, the security guard who was gambling, mm-hmm. gets called in, gets called into the principal's office. Mm-hmm. And Sinclair is the one who reads the guy the riot act and ends up making the decision to pull him from active duty. That's Garibaldi's job. He He's runs that team. Yeah. What the hell is the station commander doing? One, having that conversation. This is the first time they've talked to Benson about it. There are situations where it makes sense to escalate that up the chain of command, not on the mm-hmm. first conversation. And who is he to make the call to pull him off of act? In fact, he makes the call to pull him off of active duty. And then later on Garibaldi's team, the workers do a little mini investigation and decide on their own. Hey, eh, he's fine. We're going to pull him back. Like Garibaldi's what, what is he doing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was, I was, I was pretty blown away by both sides of his org chart, just completely cutting him off at the knee. Mm-hmm. I only have a little passion about this. <laughs> I'm all worked up about this thing. Well, right. Remind me what your Star Trek podcast right, is about. Yeah, there, maybe Jeff. about yeah, leadership a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> literally, literally that. Yeah. All right, Jeff. Well, I think with that, then we have reached the part of the show where it's time to boil it all down and see if the show has any of that Star Trek quality to it. Is there a deep moral message? Is it holding up a mirror to society? Is it giving us hope that we'll be better in the future? We're also going to rate this episode on a scale of zero to five deltas. So, Jeff, I'm going to throw it to you first. What do you think? Does this have a Star Trek equality to it? How many deltas are you giving it? And do you want to watch it again? This episode was fun, which is a really weird thing to say about the the subject matter that we watched. But I just I really liked how they used the mind construct as a way to show us what happened, you know, on the Minbari vessel. You know, I, I said I watched this twice and I had a different impression the second time. Would I watch it again? Maybe. Maybe. It's not one I'm excited about. To watch again the war prayer totally going to watch that one again right like that's that's like my standard right. here this one maybe but as far as the star trek message I have, a, I have a lot of thoughts on this so there's a scene where night two is talking about how how dangerous it is that earth is getting involved with aliens and what we hear about him about about his thoughts are so similar to what we hear today and what we heard in the mid 90s about immigrants about refugees, mm-hmm. about anyone who is other than us, right? Mm. They're coming and they're buying all of our real estate. They're taking our jobs. They're funding our activities. They're infiltrating, infiltrating our culture. Sinclair pushes back on him and he stands up for working with the Minbari. And I think to your point about him being the paragon of humanity, through the last couple episodes, we've seen Sinclair has become the model of anti-racism. He's straight up mm-hmm. calling people out on it, and he's using using his lived experience through trauma, like the trauma of being in war. He's using that to maintain peace and respectful relationships with all the other uh, all the other species. I could see that uh, flip at some point, though, where mm-hmm. he does decide. Oh my gosh, you're right; they are horrible. I do want to strangle them again. But at this point, at this point, he's doing great. The single thing. And this whole episode that really stood out to me on this, though, was was that understandable hatred that he had in there because of the PTSD that we've talked about. I see Sinclair's path going in one of two directions. One, what we're seeing him do. He's leading against all this hate, and he's going to be the example of what it looks like to build collaboration and respect and all those great things. Or he's going to flip. He's going to flip, and he's going to become a leader for some of these hate groups. And the main reason I think that might happen was this little thing I interpreted at the end when night two is getting let off and his mind is exploded at this point because Sinclair straight gacked him while he was in the mind right. chair. And he says, we're still connected. Like you're still in here. Like, I think he's still in his brain somewhere. And so I, there, I don't know. I see the potential for some manipulation down the, down the, the, down the path. Couple all that with a scene you alluded to where Dr. Franklin was talking to Delenn So Earth was losing the war, and they were going to resort to biological and chemical weapons. Dr. Franklin refused to turn over his notes. That, I mean, he stood up. He took a huge risk. That's Star Trek. And I feel like this episode hit on huge messages. Refusing to go with the flow when that flow is hateful and it's killing people. I mean, that's really the thing. That's what 
Sinclair's been doing. That's what Dr. Franklin did before. I'm going to give this one four deltas. Whoa. I only had it at three. It was the second viewing that took me to four where I'm just like, wow, this really, because what you painted in your conspiracy theory, but also we saw that like Sinclair is not going to allow these things to happen, period. Yeah. And then we have that example of Dr. Franklin putting his career on the line. That's why he ended up hitchhiking, right? Because he's like, mm-hmm. I'm out. I'm not going to play this game. I'm not going to give you my data if it's going to kill someone. And to me, that's that's the roadmap to a better future. That's what we mm-hmm. think of as Star Trek. What about you? So I want to keep talking about that scene that you had right there with Dr. Franklin. Yeah. The line that he used is he says, I took an oath. That says all life is sacred. There is literally not a more Star Trek message than that one line right there. If you want to wrap up the entirety of the Gene Roddenberry vision of the future, it is that all life is sacred. By the way, the look that Delenn gave to Dr. Franklin after he said that was telling Some people could interpret it as, oh, you're so precious. Oh, bless your little heart. They could interpret it as that. Others could be like, there's hope for you yet. That's the way to be. That's the, which I think actually fits in my theory a whole lot She's like, it's not just Sinclair, it's you too. Exactly. And she's like, yes, we're doing the right thing. So there's that. You can't get more Star Trek than that. There's also another great line that Sinclair says earlier about Benson, and it applies to everything else, Right. Uh, which, by the way, I think that all life is sacred line saying that to Delenn, I feel like that's going to come back and have ripple effects when we find out what actually happened that day with the Grey Council, because all life is sacred. Why did they pull back? Because all life is sacred. Like, like that idea, I think, is going to come back. That's hmm. that. That's why this one, I don't know, is going to come back, but I still found it a very Star Trek thing. He says this. The innocent lie because they're going to be blamed. They're scared they're going to be blamed for something they didn't do. And the guilty lie because they have no other choice. Now, what I wish he would have said there, I think this would have been more poetic, is the innocent lie because they're scared they're going to be blamed for something they didn't do. The guilty lie because they are scared they're going to be blamed for something they did do. That's the way I feel like that line should have been written. But I think that's such a, an insightful idea. Like, I could hear Captain Picard saying that. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, sir, he's lying. He's lying. Yes, he's lying because he's either scared that he's that he's going to get blamed for something he didn't actually do. Like I'm not going to I'm not going to throw the book at you for lying. It's why are you lying? That's what really matters. Like that feels very Star Trek to me. So that's two pieces. So for that, I'm going to give this one actually only two deltas. I didn't think it was that Star Trek of an episode because those were just two sort of side bits. I feel like my theory is far more Star Trek than what this episode was. And if my theory pans out, I reserve the right to come back and change my rating on this particular episode. But given what we know right now, the rest of the episode to me was a good sci-fi show. This would have been an episode of Star Trek. That's not very Star Trek to me. Um, it, it, I think th- this was a JMS wrote this episode. So this was a move the ball down the court kind of an episode that they did. And I, I have, I wonder, like, I really wonder, does JMS write those episodes that move the ball down the court? And then he lets the guest writers do the others, at least through the first season. Like, I, I don't know. I'm just guessing I, it's possible. We'll see people out there listening. They know, or some of them do. Yeah, anyway. and don't tell us. Don't tell us. <laughs> yeah, just don't tell us. We'll figure it out when we get there. But so I give it, I give it to what I watch this one again. Yes, I would watch this one again. Am I going to sit down and just put it on for funsies? Cause I got 45 minutes to kill. No, right now I'm going back to the war prayer for that, for that one, you know, or maybe even born to the purple. Cause I like that episode quite a bit as well. Uh, so yeah, Jeff, I give it two deltas. Yeah, I think that speaks a lot. Cause I know I've, I've scored a couple of episodes based on my optimism or lack thereof of what's going to happen in the future. We have, we come star Trek lets us come from such a place of privilege that up until recently, Everything was done. Like we knew all the stories they told and we could look back and say, yeah, this episode seems like it kind of, you know, missed the mark or whatever, but it pays off. Like we knew all those connections. And so we could go back through the series and rate everything pretty fairly and objectively. We have no idea where this stuff is leading. So in the moment, it might look like it's really great, but it actually leads to something that's the or vice versa. You know, we just we just Mm -hmm. don't know. Well, Brent, that's it. That is sky full of stars. 
next week. So <laughs> we'd like to play this game. We've been asking you to not share any spoilers with us. And thank you so much for not. I mean, you have no idea how much it means to us that you're helping us actually view this for the first time. But part of that is we don't do any pre-research. We don't dive into things or learn anything about it. We literally look at the name of the next episode, and then we guess what it's going to be about. So Brent, what do you think Death Walker is going to be about? This has to, I mean, this, this sounds like Soul Hunter. Death Walker, Soul Hunter. Is this Soul Hunter part two? Oh my gosh. Oh, Please let no! it not be. That's, that's my prediction. That's my prediction. Oh. This is Soul Hunter part two. Maybe it's a different species. These are Death Walkers and those were Soul Hunters. You know, I, I don't know. But this sounds so much like Soul Hunter. I'm calling it Soul Hunter part two. They come back. They come back. Oh God, it's too soon. Too soon. I feel like between Soul Hunter and Death Walker, like they're trying to help Slayer with their track listing for a new record. <laughs> <laughs> so me, I, I think this is going to be the episode that we thought infection was going to be. So I think there's going to be like a doctor, Ooh. scientist, yeah. somebody who comes on is in the med lab, infects patient zero, who then becomes a Death Walker. Oh. And here's the twist. Oh, oh, here's the twist on it. Uh -huh. The plague or the disease or whatever only targets aliens not humans oh i'll give you i'll give you a i mean kind of on what you're saying there space zombies yeah yes that's there where we the go. going yeah. space zombies isn't that kind of what soul hunter is i'm just i i feel like it's got to connect back i don't know that it's the soul hunters i just feel like they they might make an appearance in this episode and and it's going to be connected i don't i don't think our two things are mutually exclusive okay okay we're going to go from hitting in the opposite direction of the bullseye to both like at least hitting the board <laughs> nice. Right. We just came at it from two different angles, but we got there. We'll find out right here next week. Thank you so much, so much for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening and give us that star. Give us the thumbs up in your podcast, your, your podcast app you're listening to. <gasps> Jeff, 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 did you, I found out this week. Do you know where people can listen to us on? Where? I didn't even know that this was possible. They can listen to us on the Audible app. What? The audible, you, you know, those audio books that you like to listen to as well. Yeah. You can listen to Babylon first, Babylon five for the first time. Sorry. Babylon first is our Twitter handle. You can listen to Babylon five for the first time on audible. And if you like, you can leave us a rating and review on audible. How cool is that? Yeah. There you go. There's, there's so many cool places you can check us out. And we're so thankful that you do share the word, spread it, tell people that we're out there. We appreciate you more than you can possibly know. And until next time, I must, I must find out. Don't do it. I must find out what happened and why you won't let me live long and prosper. Stop. Mm. You, uh. I know. I know. It's not a Star Trek podcast. I know. It's my first time.